Well, take your Bibles, please turn to the book of Genesis chapter 24. So in Genesis 23, the message last week, Abraham was burdened about his wife who had passed and to bury her, to buy a burial ground. This chapter, his burden shifts to his son to find a bride for his son, Isaac. There are so many lessons in this Genesis 25. This is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. And I'm going to ask you to have an open heart as we go into God's word today. Would you walk with me into this passage of scripture? Would you come with me? Would you have an open heart as we consider this theme of godly goal setting from this passage of scripture? And each of us, and I'm I'm asking you to join me and walk with me here because your needs are going to be different from the other person's needs. And maybe I'm not even going to bring out an area where you need to establish goals in your life. So you have to really pray and think about it and apply this message to yourself. So that's what I want to ask you to do. And I'm going to just ask that we read together Genesis chapter number 24 and verse number 40. Just one verse as we begin. Genesis chapter 24 Verse 40, the servant of Abraham is here speaking, and he said unto me, that is, the servant is saying, Abraham said to me, this is what Abraham said to me when he sent me out, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Let's pray. So now, Lord, please work in a mighty way in every heart, applying this message exactly as it needs to be applied in each life. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I really want to challenge you about this matter of godly goal setting as we're in a new year. Don't think, oh, I don't need to set any goals. Abraham was old and almost ready to die, and he had a goal to a set in his life. You're never too old to set a specific goal in your life. Godly. Let's make godly goals in our life. Now, there's three kinds of goals I want us to just look at very quickly in our introduction. Some have said godly goals are statements of faith. What do you believe God could use you to do and be and have? Goals are statements of faith. There's three kinds of goals we can look at. There's blanks in your notes if you're following along in the bulletin. There's blanks. There's three kinds of goals. The first goal is what? Character goals. That is, what does God want you to be? Set a goal. God, what do you want me to be? I want to be a godly husband. I want to be a loving pastor. You need to be a loving wife if you're married. You need to be obedient children for, for if you, your parents are still alive. What does God want you to be? I want to be hungry for spiritual things. I want to be one who mourns over my sin. What does God want you to be? Establish character goals in your life. Maybe there's a sin, and there's a besetting sin. God, I want to be victorious over that sin in this year. What does God want you to be? I want to be revived by the Holy Spirit of God. Make that your prayer. Make that your goal. What is your goal? Establish godly goals in your life. Don't say, well, I don't have any. Just be rich, famous. Come on. We should be people who are striving to know the Lord. Be a soul winner. Be a person of prayer. Be a man of God. Be a woman of God. What is your goal? You should write it down. Write it down. I'm going to ask you as you think about this, even during this message, if you say, this is what I, this is a goal, write it down. Character goals, career goals. What do you want to do? (laughs) 
in these challenging times? What does God want you to do? That's what Paul asked. Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? God would have God had a purpose for our lives. Amen. What does God want you to do? Say, well, I'm not sure. Pray about it. Does God want you to go to school? Does God want you to get a job or get another job? Get a new job. What is your goal? To start a business, to enter into the ministry. What does God want you to do regarding your career? And then thirdly, what does God want you to do in your personal life, personal goals? So the three kinds of goals are character, career, personal. Personal goals. What do you want to have? I'm not just talking about material things. You know what God wants you to have? A time with God every day. I want to have a time where I open up my Bible or your phone or however you do it every day. Read the word of God. You must have these devotions. It's very important. You must have a time of regular prayer. Make that your goal. Let me ask you a question. Did you get on your knees to talk to God this week, every day, five out of the seven, okay. Make it your goal every day, every day. Even all, even you get to the end of your day and you forgot, oh man, I got so busy. Sometimes we do get, we get busy. Get on your knees, talk to God as you get into bed. Make that your personal goal, to have a meaningful time of prayer with God every day. And you say, but I need a car. Well, pray about it. That you can have a car too. <laughs> or I want to get my own apartment. That's okay. You can pray about that too. There's nothing wrong with praying for material things, things that you could have or do. Personal goals. This should actually say, it wasn't updated. It should, what do I want to have? That should say, have there. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever written your testimony down? Your testimony of salvation, your testimony of a call to God, to serve God? Have you ever written your test? Make that a goal. Write it down. Write down your testimony. I'm going to write out my testimony. We had a speaker here a few years ago. He encouraged every believer to make a gospel track out of their testimony because your testimony of what God has done in your life is absolutely unique. He's not done it just that way for anyone else. Say, well, my story is not exciting. Yes, it is. If God is in the center of it, it's exciting. Write your testimony down. Maybe you read a book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess to you. I had a book. I, I told you I had some free books back there. I had a book I was going to bring. And it's, it's a well-known book. It's called Disciplines of a Godly Man. And I haven't read it myself. It's been in my library. I just haven't got the chance to. I was going to put it on the table. I said, you know what? I'm going to make a goal to read that book. So I didn't bring it. It's not on the table. I kept it. But read, read godly books. Read missionary biographies. If you've never read the biography of Adoniram Judson to the Golden Shore, write it down. Get it off of Amazon. Make it your goal. I'm going to read to the Golden Shore. It'll change your life. Or I'm going to read the two-volume set of Hudson Taylor. That'll keep you busy. It'll keep your television off for a while. Read the two-volume set of the great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. The growth of a soul, the growth of a work of God. Goals are important because when you establish godly goals, they will bring blessing to others, to the world you're living in. The servant of Abraham sets out to find a bride for Isaac, and this will bless the world. It's blessed us. Godly goals bring blessing to the world. And godly goals will help you to establish a more God-focused life. We need to focus and center our life on the Lord. Amen? Especially in this day and age. We can be distracted, and we can murmur, and we can complain. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's a good verse for us. 
God-centered goals lead us to prayer. They lead us to worship God. They lead us to fellowship with Christians. They lead us to know Christ better. They lead us to get his direction, to get his purpose for our life. They lead us to have a worldview that glorifies God. And godly goals will help us to live more focused life. When you establish a goal and somebody says, hey, you want to do this? And it's just a waste of time. You'll learn to say what? No. No, I'm not going to go that direction. I have a godly goal. I'm not going to go in the direction of the world. I'm a, so when you establish goals that glorify God, you, you'll learn how to say no to certain things and yes to the right things. So whether you have long-term, short-term, personal goals, career goals, character goals, goals are statements of faith. They will help you to bring blessing to your world and lead you to live a more focused life. That's the introduction. Now, I want us to see Six things this morning about godly goal setting. God has a purpose for your life. And because he does, we must have an action plan. An action plan to set and reach our goals. And that's what Abraham is really, there's almost a template for us as he is sending out his servants to find a bride. That's the goal. This is not an easy task. His servant is going to go halfway around the world. We don't know if he's ever been there. And he's going to find one bride to bring back for Isaac. Do you think that's an easy job? <laughs> so that's his goal. Very specific. So we must also have an action plan to set and reach our God with goals. Here's the first thing. We've got to assess our situation. So look at Genesis 24, verse 1. Assess your situation. So I put here in your notes on the screen as well, where am I right now? What are my gifts, my strengths? What time is it in my life? What's my spiritual condition? What are my finances like? These are assess your situation. But Abraham assesses his situation. And what's his situation in verse one? What's his situation? He's what? He's old. But what, what else is his situation? God has blessed me. God had prospered him. So you might say, well, I'm too old. There's negatives that can hold you back from, from achieving new, new things or setting goals. But God has also blessed you in other ways. God had prospered him and blessed him. So Abraham had entered into senior citizenship. Not a time to stop goal setting. And what I love about this is God had promised Abraham that come forth from him is going to come what? A seed. As, as mul like the multitude of what's in the sky, the stars as what's on the seashore, all the grains of sand on the seashore. God's gonna, Abraham's going to have a seed. So, so God's given him this promise to say, Abraham, say, say Well, the Lord asked for the promise. Now do it. Now you pray about it. But take action. Take the promises of God and don't sit on them. God, God's promises do not lead us to laziness, but to godliness. God's promises don't lead us to live lazy lives, but action-packed Godly lives going after and seeing, desiring to see those promises fulfilled. Amen? Take action with those promises. That's what Abraham is doing. God's promised him this. So he assesses his situation. So, of course, in this chapter, I have to make this application. Abraham is wanting to find what? For his son? A bride, marriage. So let's just make this application to marriage for a moment. Now, I will just say, I've been married for 40 years. And I cannot imagine being single. I would never want to be single. And I do want all the single people to be married. Because marriage is, to me, awesome. I didn't say it was always easy. But I say it's awesome. If I were single 
and had a desire to be married, what I would do would be to do what Abraham does, assess my situation. And then I would take a word from God. I would take like a verse from Genesis where God told Adam, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. I'll take that promise. I'll say, okay, God, that's what you said. It's not good that, I'm gonna, that I should be alone. And I agree. And God, you said you would make a helper, a helper suitable for me, just for me. Okay, Lord, I'll take you at your word. And I would pray over that and claim it by faith and see it fulfilled. I would not sit on that. I would take action with it. Now, there's certainly different things you can do. You could go halfway around the world to find a bride, like Abraham does, send his servant halfway around. Don't go around. Don't go next door. Go halfway around the world. Now, there is a way you can go halfway around the world to find a bride. (laughs) Use your servant. It's called a computer. Use your servant as a computer. Now, your computer is not a master. It's a servant. Now, the question I'm going to pose to you in finding a bride in this day and age, when, let's face it, if you're single, the number of singles you are going to meet is limited. For those of you single, you want to find a husband, you want to find a wife, you, you've been to this church for a while, you say like, ah, you know, I know the singles there. I don't know what's, I don't think anything's, you know. And then you've been to your job and you know who works and you're like, nah. And you've looked around at your neighbors and you say, oh, come on. Where am I going to find somebody around here? So is it an act of desperation to go onto the computer and use a godly type of Christian dating site to find a potential spouse? Is that an act of desperation? I don't think so. If I were single, I would probably try it anyway. I know some of you have tried it and it didn't work, and that's fine. If you say, well, I don't want to use it, that's fine too. I'm not saying you should do it or shouldn't. I'm saying that if God leads you to do it, you may, I believe, as you do it prayerfully in a godly way. E-Harmony, Christian Mingle, there's another one I never had heard of. I just Googled the top ones. Zusk, you probably have heard of that, those of you who are single. I don't know if, I don't know, Z-O-O-S-K. Little commercial for Zusk there. (laughs) But I I thought of, you know, Rebecca and how far away she was from Isaac. Your potential spouse could be halfway around the world. Abraham sent out his servant. He, he gave his profile, the profile of Isaac, to the servant. So when the servant met Rebecca, he said, here's my, here's my master. This is, his, this is what he's like, you know. And the riches of Abraham and Isaac were shown to Rebecca and to her family. I don't find anything wrong in using technology for godly advantage because the fact is we all use technology. How many of you have cell phones now? But make sure it's not your master, but it is your servant. And it's not an act of desperation to to maybe find the right person. Some of you have actually found your husband or your wife through dating services online. I do believe it would be an act of desperation for a Christian to dress immodestly in order to attract a person of the opposite sex. It is an act of desperation to go to nightclubs and bars and to ungodly places. That's an act of desperation. Don't do that to try to catch someone. You'll catch the wrong person. So assess your situation. Where am I right now? That's the question. The second point is refuse to compromise. Refuse to compromise. So what does Abraham tell his servant? Put your hand under my thigh. That's his strength. The strength of his body, his thigh, one of the strongest muscles you have. Put your hand under my thigh and swear to me by the Lord God of heaven, verse 3, 
that you shall not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country, to my kindred, take a wife of my son, Isaac. So Abraham is refusing to compromise. So if your goal is to find a husband or a wife, don't compromise. Don't settle for anything but the will of God. You're seeking a godly goal. So Abraham's goal was not merely to just get any wife. As long as she has a dress, bring her back. You know? <laughs> that wasn't his goal. His goal was for Isaac to find the right kind of wife who would stay with Isaac and remain in Isaac and sojourn as a stranger in the land with Isaac. And Abraham clearly tells him, do not go here to take a wife for Isaac. Don't go to the Canaanites around the people we're dwelling. They are wicked. There's an ungodly culture. The women are having babies and sacrificing them to their gods all over. Now, the principle of this passage, and it's really throughout the scripture, is that a Christian must, if, he's, if he or she's going to marry in the will of God, must marry a Christian. The principle is a Christian, and I guess I have to say this today, a Christian man must marry a Christian woman to establish a Christian home. That's God's will in marriage. If you're going to be married, ladies, a Christian woman must marry a Christian man. And there's many scriptures, I won't look at them all right now, but I believe the principle is here, even though what's it's kind of interesting, how Isaac or how Abraham kind of spells it out for his servant when he says, you shall not take a wife to the sons of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son, Isaac. The principle I believe that we see in this passage of scripture is marry someone whom you share critical life principles and a worldview in common with that person. Marry someone that you share foundational world uh, uh, worldview with. I don't believe it's wrong to marry outside of your ethnic ethnicity. Although he tells his servant, go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife. Now that is interesting. It is not wrong at all for a person to marry outside of their ethnic group or nationality, the color of their skin or whatever. I believe the principle is a Christian man must marry a Christian woman. But isn't it true though, on the other hand, that most people, not everyone, most people do end up marrying someone of their ethnicity. It's not wrong. There's somebody else, whatever, but most people do decide that. Why? Because they share that in common. Here's the fact about marriage, and I, I have a little experience. 40 years, I've passed 40 years, so I can say. One of the most difficult things you will do in life isn't finding the right person. It's staying married to the person you thought was right when you got married. That will be one of the greatest challenges. Look at the divorce rates. Marriage is not going to be just living happily ever ever. Why, why do the stories end when they get married? That's when the fights begin. Man. You know? I did have my, I told you about my first fight that I had with my wife. It was in the pastor's office before we even left the church. But making up is always good. The principle, though, is marry someone with whom you share things in common. Why? Because whoever you marry, you're going to have so many things that are different with them that it's important that you foundationally share 
the most important things in common. And the things that you, now, when I got married to Debbie, I thought, wow, we are, we're just so much alike. We agree with everything. And then I was married for a few years. And I'm like, wow, we are like totally different. She does not care about sports at all, you know, <laughs> or whatever. I mean, what I'm saying is the differences often don't come out until after you get married. And then guess what? It's too late. You stay married, work it out. But when you have the same faith as someone and you have the same worldview, the same faith in the, in the Bible, in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's salvation, and we have the same Holy Spirit and we can get on our knees together and pray together through the trials and through the ups and through the downs, marriage by the grace of God can stand. So that's basically what I see Abraham telling his servant. Go back to my kindred, go back to my country, and find a wife for Isaac. So this servant had a, had a tough job. He had to find the right woman who would separate from her world. She had to come with him, become a sojourner in the new world. And... He had, Abraham sent him out, and he actually had to be willing to fail attempting to do God's will than to succeed through compromise. And that's important. So have unbending convictions. Can I just also challenge our dear singles here today? And I know some want to be married, and it's, it's not easy in our city to find a Christian spouse. It's not easy. My heart does go out, and my prayers are with you. But just remember that this servant went out and got a bride for Isaac. Had she ever seen him? Had he ever seen her? <laughs> you know, sometimes we make so much. Now, I know, look, when I saw my wife, I, I was like in love, you know, when I saw her. So there is, you know, we have eyes and we're attracted physically, and I'm not going to discount that. But remember that whoever you marry, you're both going to get old and wrinkly with, and all the good looks and beauty will ultimately fade, except my wife. She's still beautiful. I got blessed, but, but remember that no one is perfect. And if you're looking for the perfect spouse, just look at yourself. And remember, you're not either. None of us are. If you get married to someone who's a Christian, you know who you're going to marry? A sinner saved by grace. And that's who you are as well. We're all just sinners saved by grace. But I do encourage Christians in this day, you know, fewer people are getting married. More people are shacking up. Christians need to get married. Christians need to have children and raise those children up for the Lord because the few are doing it and it's not easy, but that's the home is under attack. So we need to see Christian homes established and we need, we need to set that as a goal in our church. Actually, I pray about that. And I ask you to pray with me that God would Bring the right people to our singles that they could find the right person and, and get married and establish a Christian home with them. But be willing to fail doing God's will. Don't compromise in the process. Okay. The servant says, okay, you don't want me to go here to the land of Canaan. What if I go there to this faraway place? And there's a word in verse 5, per adventure. He says, per adventure, the women will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring your son again to the land from whence you came? And Abraham said, never. <laughs> Beware that you do not bring, thou bring not, do not bring my son back to the land. Do not take my son away from this family structure here. So the word per adventure, I'm getting my what if from that word. The servant basically just says, what if she's not willing to leave her world for, for wandering around with you, Abraham and Isaac? 
What if she's not willing to be a stranger in this strange land? What if she's comfortable in her, in her land and she doesn't want to come with me? And actually, ultimately, even though parents were very involved in the marriages of their children, and Abraham is actually taking the initiative here, but ultimately, it was Rebecca's choice to say, I will go. And that's one of the great statements of this chapter, by the way, at the end, where they said, Rebecca, will you go? She said, I will go. It was ultimately her decision. But the servant is anticipating the potential problems. So when you set a goal, assess your situation, refuse to compromise, and then anticipate the what ifs the potential problems that may keep you back from achieving that goal. Now, this was a legitimate question because Rebecca might look at that servant and say, well, I think you're a fraud. I'm not following you back there for this, to this family. I don't know if I could trust you. you know? She had to have a lot of trust, right? So wh what, if, what if that happened? Or what if she didn't believe who the servant was. What if she says, I might, I, I might not love this man when I get there. I mean, that would be a terrible situation, right? Or what if he doesn't love me? I don't think I should go because when he sees me or gets to know me, maybe he won't love me. I, I don't think I want to do that. And the servant couldn't force her. And there's a beautiful picture here, really, about this. Uh, we can make this, this application. If you were uneasy about marriage or my conversation about marriage, take it easy. Rest. It's okay. I want to talk about evangelism. I want to make an application toward evangelism. Because there's a beautiful application here toward evangelism. So we're in a new year. I want to encourage you. And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Let's make it a goal to see someone come to Christ this year through our witness. Write that goal down. Set that as a goal in your life. I want to lead someone. I want to tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to go and seek them. I'm going to witness to them. But you might, but the, but you might say, but what if? Peradventure, they don't believe what I tell them. What if they think I'm a fraud? <laughs> you know, Isaiah groaned with the same, if you will, what if, when he says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We cry those same words as Isaiah today as we pass out gospel tracts in our city or try to witness to our family and our loved ones. And we wonder, are we doing any good? Is anybody, will anybody, who has believed our report it seems as if so few believe on the Lord today in our circle of where we live. Does that mean just don't even try? It's not worth it. You're wasting your time. No, not at all. We're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every man or woman, all of creation. By the way, that verse talks about that all men are created. The Great Commission is based on the truth that every man and woman is an image bearer of God. Preach the gospel, Jesus said, to every creature that is created being. We're all created in the image of God, but fallen into sin, and people need to hear the message of God's great love for sinners. And it seems as if most folks do not care for his great love, but this should not and must not ever hold us back from going. And Abraham's counsel to his servant is quite interesting too. Because the servant says, well, what if, what if they don't hear me? Should I bring Isaac down to them? And Abraham says what? No. Now there's an application. You know what the, the application is? We bring Christ to the world. And in a way... People could say, when they hear of Christ, the same thing Rebecca said. But I've never seen him. Oh, but you, he loves you. He loves you. 
And you will learn to love him whom having not seen ye love. And he will give you a life of joy and salvation and rejoicing. If you're here without Christ, come to Jesus. Believe in him today. But Abraham says, don't bring Isaac back to that land. And the application is we must not bring Christ down to the level of this world to make him acceptable to sinners. We must not tone down the truth. We must not tone down the truth of repentance from sin, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We, we must not become like the world to win people to Christ. We don't become worldly to win the world. Spurgeon has an amazing message on this passage of scripture, and it's, and it's about, and it's, I think he called it no compromise. And this is what's his application throughout the message. And this is what Spurgeon said. And he lived in the late 1800s. This is like 1888. But even then, listen to what Spurgeon said. It was like he lived, yes, he, he lives today. He says, the new plan is to assimilate the church to the world. What does that mean? He says, the plan, what, what the church is trying to do to win the world is embrace the, the way the world is doing things and win the world that way. Spurgeon says, that's what the church is doing. By dramatic performances, they make houses of prayer approximate to the theater. I have seen churches that look like nightclubs. Oh, a lot of people go to the nightclub. Let's make the church look like the nightclub and people will come to our church. People like rock and roll concerts. Let's make the church a big rock and roll concert and people will come to our church. That's exactly what Spurgeon was talking about. By dramatic performances, they make Houses of prayer, like the theater, they turn their services into musical displays and their sermons to amuse men. The church is not to embrace the world, to win the world. A lot of churches, that's how they're numerically growing. We want to grow. With all my heart, I want our church to grow. I want to see souls come to Jesus Christ. I want to see people born again. Isn't that what we want? But it must grow in a godly fashion. Not because we have brought Christ down into the world. And that's what Abraham tells his servant he must not do. And here's an example. Maybe this is a far-fetched example. But I've seen a number of churches doing this, literally bringing drag queens into the church, men dressed up like women and singing to the children. And these individuals are being held up as courageous because they are actually expressing themselves the way what they say how God has made them. This is perverse. This is in Methodist churches and in other denominational type churches. I think Lutheran, I've seen it in, and probably others as well. This is an extreme example, but this is the kind of world we're living in now. The fourth thing is we must claim a promise. So now we go down to Genesis chapter 24. And verse seven, he says, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me and that swear unto me, unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send the angel before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So Abraham simply says, this is what God has promised. If God has promised this, let's see him work it out. This must be the time. Abraham was getting old. And Abraham wanted to at least see the, 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 that his son would be married to a godly woman, that the seed would come forth from Isaac. So there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Which one will you make your own? You know, we would not be here today without the promise of God. Because God gave me a promise from Acts 18, verse 10. The Lord promised Paul and corn, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. That was the promise that God gave me as a new believer. And I said, Lord, 
If you had much people in the city of Nineveh, and you had much people in the city of Corinth, where Paul was when you gave him that promise, you have much people in New York City. And I still believe that. Now, much doesn't mean all, but much means much. Is that good Italian? Much people in this city. I love that. God has that. But we don't just sit back on that promise and say, okay, God, bring them in. No, we have to go out and put action to these promises. As I, as I said earlier, claim a promise and then put feet to your promise and wear out your shoes to see it fulfilled. And that's what, by the grace of God, God I've tried to do over these years is wear out my shoes and telling people about Jesus Christ. 7,000 promises in the Bible. Set goals based on these promises. Attempt something that you would never otherwise attempt to do, but God has promised it. See, Abraham wouldn't have known this. He wouldn't have known that God was going to have a seed as vast as the stars. And the, God promised it to Abraham. Though. Okay, Lord, you promised it. That's what I'm going to act on. See, I never would have come to New York if it weren't for the grace of God saving me and then God promising. Set goals and attempt to do things that you would never otherwise do in the power of the flesh. Because we're no longer in the flesh in that sense, but we're walking in the spirit. And let the size of God determine the size of your goal. Not just your human perspective, but God's perspective. Let the size, the greatness of God, determine the size and direction of your goal. Now, when I went to Bob Jones University, I transferred from Clemson. I can't get too far away. So I had taken English 101 and 102 at Clemson. And so when I, so when I went to Bob Jones, I went as like a sophomore but they wanted to test my English skills. That was actually a good move on their part. I didn't think so then, because when I got my English te test, my English test tested, my English skills tested, came to talk, you see, I, I flunked that, that test. So th they had a class, they called it remedial English. We called it bonehead English. It's for the, it was the bonehead English class. I, I, was, I was a member. <laughs> when, when I got into bonehead English, they said, okay, now we're gonna test your spelling. And I was like, oh, great, another test. So I, I flunked that one, too. So I was in double bonehead English class. So that's just my background. I'm not an expert in grammar and spelling and things like that. I, my wife and I have been playing Scrabble recently. I could never beat my wife in Scrabble in a million years. But it's okay. She wins, and that's actually the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> but I just... So, but God put in my heart to write a book about the city. There's no way I could write a book. But God put it in my heart and I prayed about it. And I claimed the promise. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And so I started to, to write. And then I sent off the, the draft to a publisher. And so, somebody said they will publish it and so forth. And it was like a roller coaster. I mean, sometimes you get on a real like hot streak and you're writing like crazy and you think, man, this is going to be the greatest book in the history of the world. And other times you're like way down here, like, oh, no, this is a, uh, it's never going to happen, you know? And you kind of, life is that way, right? It's like a roller coaster. Sometimes you get excited and sometimes it's difficult, but you keep on claiming those promises of God and expect success in it all. Because by the grace of God, I was able to write that book and then another one. That was a double miracle. Expect his success. So the question I have here, and I love this question. Young people, think about this question. What would you attempt for God if you knew you wouldn't fail? What would you attempt for God if you knew you wouldn't fail? Go for it. Go for your dream in a, if it's a godly dream and desire that you have. Don't be afraid. Don't say, oh, I could never do that. How do you know unless you try? 
Well, I might fail. You might fail. It's okay. You pick yourself up. And when you fail, you might get set in another direction that you never would have thought you would have gone in. There's nothing wrong with failure. Someone has said Babe Ruth struck out a whole lot more times than he hit home runs, but he kept swinging. Keep swinging. Keep working. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Expect success. Why? Why should we expect success? Verse 7 says, he will send his angel before thee. That angel in Abraham's context is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is with us. Jesus will lead us. He will bless us. He will keep us. He will prosper our way. And we have his promises. As he says in verse 7, he shall send his angel before thee and you shall take a wife. You shall take a wife unto my son from thence. Abraham was sure of that promise. And he says, you will prosper in that way. Now, we read when we started this message, verse 40, and it had that word in it. Basically, the, in verse 40, if you could look there again, the servant was summarizing what Abraham said in verse 7. But he says it a little differently. He says, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. That word prosper is Psalm 1. Do you want to prosper? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, or sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Prosper. That's that word right there. Joshua. When Joshua was going to go into that land, and take that land after Moses had died. God had told him, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord is with thee, whither so, whithersoever thou goest. And verse 7, he says, only be thou strong and very courageous. Be strong, church. Be courageous. Don't live in fear that you may keep the law. Obey God. Don't turn to the left or to the right. That whatsoever you may do. That, which, uh, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Prosper. That's the promise. We don't have to seek the novel inventions of deluded men to be prosperous in our church, in our families, in our personal lives. We have the word of God. We have the wisdom of God for true prosperity and true success. Expect success. And then the last thing is simply this. Surrender to God's result. So Abraham says, there you go, servant. Go. And he says in verse 8 and 9, and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then you shall be clear from this mile. Only bring not my son there again. And the servant put his hand, he he had put his hand under his thigh. It says it at the beginning and the end here, the thigh being the servant submitting to Abraham as his master and as his strength. And, and actually, throughout the story, the servant refers to his master 22 times, 23 times, something like that. And so he put his hand under his thigh and he swore concerning this. And the, the principle is simply this. Ultimate success is in God's hand. Ultimate success is according to his plan, his providence, and his presence. Abraham tells him he will be blameless and guiltless. He will be clear from the oath if he follows his counsel and Rebecca is not willing to follow him. So he had to ultimately, and that's what we ought to do, is surrender to God's results and the question I have here is, are you willing to exercise all diligence? Doing the things we've talked about, assessing your situation, refusing to compromise, anticipate the what ifs, claim a promise, expect his success, but then surrender to God's results as you set godly goals. Surrender to his result. The true servant of God is responsible. We are responsible for exercising all diligence. And all faithfulness, but ultimate success or non-success is up to God. We're not responsible for it. 
We're called to be faithful. So may God bless you as you set godly goals. I hinted earlier in this message to a remarkable parallel in this story as I closed. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. There is a remarkable parallel in this story. And, and if you're here without Jesus, I'm almost done. But again, if, if you're not a Christian, can you listen to me for just a moment? What I have to say is very important. I know you've been listening for a while. And if you've tuned me out, can you please turn me back on for just a moment? I want you to see the miracle of the Bible. The Bible is a miraculous book. There is a remarkable parallel in the way that the servant seeks a wife for Isaac. And the way we as God's servants seek for souls today. Now, Isaac in this story, we could see is what we would call a type of Christ. Say, what well, way? Remember back in chapter 22, Abraham offered him up. He was going to offer him up as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. And then Abraham received Isaac back as it were almost risen from the dead when God provided the land. And now he's seeking a bride for Isaac. Now watch, think about that. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And then the Holy Spirit came upon the church. And God sent the church out to seek a bride for his son. It's an amazing parallel. Just as Abraham sends out this unnamed servant to seek a bride, the father sends out his spirit-filled church. To woo and win souls for Christ. And this servant is an incredible example for us. For one, he doesn't magnify himself. He magnifies his master. He shows forth the riches of Abraham. He says, look at all the gold. Look at the silver. He, my master's been blessed. So I'm here to say, don't look at me. Look at Jesus Christ. Let me magnify Jesus. His love is like a love you'll never experience. His power is a power you'll never know unless you know him as your savior in this life. He is alive from the dead. Jesus Christ loved you so much. He died on the cross and shed his blood. And he rose again. He's the God of all power of heaven and earth. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. He's a powerful savior, risen from the dead. And then lastly, I'll just say this about the servant. There's, a, uh, there's more that to be said. I'll say it next week. But I find it so fascinating that the servant appeals to Rebecca to leave her world and go follow someone she's, she's never seen. And that's what I'm appealing for you. If you're here without Jesus Christ, I appeal to you. Leave your world. Leave your idols. Leave your sin, leave your drinking, leave your fornication, leave it all behind because that will lead you to hell and follow Jesus Christ. Though you've never seen him, he will love you like no one will ever love you. He will lead you like nothing will ever lead you. He will provide for you. He will care for you and he will never stop being with you. As we close, can you stand with me as we read first Peter chapter one and then we'll pray. I say, come to Jesus if you're here not saved. Just like Rebecca had to come to Isaac, and she said, I will go. If you read the whole chapter, you'll see those words in there. She said, I will go. I pray if there's anyone here without Jesus, you'll say today, I will go. I will follow Jesus. I will trust him. He's alive. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Now, I do this for the benefit of those, if there's anyone here, and I don't know, but if you're here without Jesus, okay, I'm going to ask those of you who are saved, those of you who are saved, have you ever seen Jesus Christ in the flesh? Anyone? No one here has seen Jesus. But let me ask you this. It says here, whom have you not seen that you love? How many here have never seen Jesus, but you say, I love him because he loves me? Look at that. That's the kind of place we're in, to love Jesus. You can love him, though you've never seen him. 
And he says, you can rejoice that you have received salvation. How many would say, Pastor Matt, yes, I've been saved and I rejoice I've received salvation. Put your hand up. Amen. You see that? You can rejoice that you have salvation in Christ. If you're here without Jesus, come to him today. Let's pray.